Good morning and welcome to the Grace Church. I'm Andrew Farley. So excited that you have joined us this morning. Just a reminder, if you would like to support us here at the Grace Church, we've got a lot going around the world with BibleQuestions.com, reaching thousands of people every day in their native tongue, and of course, the heartbeat of faith with millions of downloads, and of course, our radio program six days a week across North America on Sirius XM and dozens of other AM and FM stations in the United States and Canada. We're so grateful for your support. We're reaching people. We're freeing the captives. We're encouraging Christians in the gospel for the saved. And that is so exciting. Thank you for your support. You can give your gift in the lobby if you're at one of our campuses. And of course, you can give online at thegracechurch.org. Now, I'm in West Texas. Speaking of our campuses, I'm visiting Lubbock this weekend, and I'll be back in our Las Colinas studio next Sunday. So for those in Las Colinas, I say good morning and hello, and I'm so excited to have this beautiful opportunity every couple of months to go to West Texas and visit the saints in Lubbock. Well, with that said, we're going to continue continue our series in the book of Colossians. We're talking about being complete in Jesus Christ. Why don't we open with a word of prayer together? Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you would minister to us powerfully, that we would see Jesus and the truth of the gospel, the liberating reality of our new place in Christ, that we're clean and close and qualified because of you not because of anything we've done, but that we have so much to be grateful for because of your finished work. We give you this time in Jesus' name, amen. Complete in Christ, this, the message of Colossians. I'm excited that we're continuing our series today, and we're now in the second half of chapter one of Colossians, and we'll journey just a bit into chapter two as well. Now, Paul continues this way. He says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. All right, so what is Paul saying? He's saying that your problem is not just your deeds. It came from an alienation. It came from a place of being a foreigner to God. You were a citizen of this world, but you were not a citizen of the kingdom. And therefore, when you recognize what Paul is saying, he's actually identifying a DNA issue. He's identifying a heart issue. It's more than lying and cheating and stealing and disobedience. It is a a bloodline. It is a lineage. He says that you're alienated and, did you notice, it says you're hostile in mind. That means you couldn't please God and there was a a barrier wall and you couldn't rise to the occasion. You couldn't fulfill the law for yourself. You couldn't do anything to actually make God happy with you because of your condition. And so it's really a biology problem. Do you hear that? That's why Jesus comes along and he says you've got to be born again. Hello, that's reality staring us in the face. This is not behavior, it's birth. Yes, there's mention of behavior, but at the root of the behavior is the birth. You've only had one birth. You were born in Adam, he's saying. You need to be reborn in Christ. And so he is giving them their past resume, and then, of course, he's going to talk about their conversion, where they got a transfer, where they got a new citizenship, where they got new lineage and new bloodline and new DNA. So he's identified the problem. You were formerly, in the past, you were alienated. Now, you can see where he's going, right? I mean, if he tells you you were alienated and foreign, what is he going to tell you next? That you're now reconciled and close. And so isn't that the beautiful message of the gospel? The problem is we're not teaching it. I mean, globally, in the church, we're still telling people, 
as Christians, you need to get right with God. Well, wait a minute. I was alienated. Now I'm reconciled. I was hostile in mind, but now I've got the mind of Christ. So why do we keep telling people to get right with God and get clean before God or get closer to God when we're no longer alienated? Now, this next verse really shows us the truth of what God has already done. It says, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you what? Before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now, what does that tell you? Nobody's blaming you anymore. God's not blaming you. You are blameless. Now, furthermore, holiness is not some personal pursuit. We keep talking about the personal pursuit of holiness. Well, God's already pursued holiness for you. He found it. His name is Jesus, and he gave it to you. You have been made holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That means God's not going to criticize you. He finds no fault with you. He delights in you. You're great with him. That's the gospel, that you have been reconciled and you're great with God. Now, Paul continues and he says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. All right? Notice the if. I mean, there's a big elephant in the room, right? And that is this if. If you continue. Now, last week I, I alluded to this. There are people out there that are teaching that, uh, well, you know what? The whole world's saved. The whole world's reconciled, forgiven, and saved, and born again. Now, if that's true, then why did Paul put an if here? Because there is a requirement for this to be true of you. Yet people are using this passage. I mean, people are using this exact verse to say that, well, you know what? The whole world is good with God. Now, notice he says, if you continue and if you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Now, that means you've heard it, but what have you done with it? You've heard it, but have you accepted it or rejected it? And so the reality is, Everybody has to make a response about Jesus. They have to have a reaction to the gospel. They have to respond to it by faith in order to be a believer who is a receiver because we receive by faith, and when we do, then we are reconciled, saved, justified, and forgiven forever. We are possessors of eternal life. But that's not what this verse is saying about all of them. Some of these Colossians, they have heard the gospel, and yet some of them apparently might be moving away from it. And so Paul is very carefully saying make sure you continue. Now, some of you have heard five minutes of the gospel, some of you have heard five hours, and some of you have heard five years of the gospel, perhaps. Who knows? But the bottom line is, you got to continue. Continue to hear and believe. Now, many of them are already saved, but he doesn't know everybody by name. He doesn't know everybody's spiritual condition and so what do you say to a crowd of 50 people, 500 people, 5,000 people? What would I say to you if I were talking in this moment to a crowd who would then share this video sermon with other people and it would be shared all over the place, which it will be, then what should I say to a group of people, most of whom I don't know personally? I might say, continue, 
continue hearing and believing, continue investigating the claims of Christianity, continue in the gospel, understanding the cross and the resurrection, because if you continue, then at some point in that journey, you will be born again. Now, if you're already born again, what would I say to you? Continue because you can grow in Christ, you can get to know the love and grace of God. Oh my goodness, isn't that awesome? So continue works for everybody, even if you don't know the recipients of your letter, and that's my whole point. All right, so with that said, the whole world is not saved. The whole world is not in Christ. There is a response to the gospel that is required, and this passage clearly indicates that. All right, now Paul says next in verse 23, he says, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So again, we've seen this verb heard. You've heard it, and I've proclaimed it. Now, I don't know what you've done with it, but I know you've heard it, and I know I've proclaimed it, but you got to do something with it. What is your response to the message of Jesus? Because a response is required. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, if you're following along with what this passage is saying, you should have a pretty hefty question in mind right about now. I mean, lacking in Christ's afflictions? Is Jesus really lacking anything? Did he not suffer enough, Paul? I mean, come on, the cross? How about the lashes he took? How about all of the the crown of thorns and the ridicule, people spitting on him, all of the mocking? Was that not enough for you, Paul? What do you mean about what was lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, it's pretty obvious that what Paul is saying is that he is suffering for the gospel as a messenger, as an apostle. He is suffering for the gospel, and there's going to be more to come. And there's a plan, right? The gospel impacts the world in a certain way, and there is always resistance, and there's always tribulation, and there's always affliction. So what hasn't happened yet is lacking because the plan has to unfold. So this is not about the atoning work of Christ, as they call it, what I call propitiation, This is not about something being lacking in the cross. There's nothing lacking. This is not about something being lacking in the resurrection. There's nothing lacking. This is not about some piece of the gospel being missing. Paul is simply saying what a joy, what a privilege it is to suffer in the name of Jesus Christ. And guess what? My life is not over. My mission is not over. The church's mission is not over. So there's still some more affliction that's coming. And that's what he means here. So as we continue, we go to verse 25. It says, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Now, why does he say fully? Because of what I just explained. Remember, we talked about what was lacking What's lacking is not Jesus. Jesus isn't lacking. What's lacking is not the cross. The cross isn't lacking. What's lacking is not the resurrection. That's certainly not lacking. But Paul is wanting to fully carry out the preaching of this word of God. So that's what he means by there's a future that hasn't happened yet. There's more preaching to come. And with that more preaching is going to come more affliction. So verse 26, he says, that is the mystery that has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. Mystery. Paul uses that word on purpose. Oh my goodness, he knows the Colossians 
They sure do love a good mystery. Remember, during week one, we talked about Colossae, the melting pot of movements and cultures and religions and lots of mystery religions, and people started mixing the mysteries together. I'll take a little bit of that religion and a little bit of that one and a little bit of that one. Gnosticism being one of many. But oh my goodness, the Stoics and the Epicureans and the Gnostics and so many different lifeless, empty philosophies of how to make life work, they were rampant in the city of Colossae. Now, Paul, on purpose, is talking about a mystery. And you better believe they, their ears perk when they hear this word. But what's different about Paul is he's going to say this mystery is not secret knowledge. This mystery is a person. And it's knowledge of a person who is Jesus, who lives in you when you believe and receive. He comes to take up residence inside of your person So you don't have to be the smartest guy on the block. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be an Epicurean philosopher. You don't have to be an incredible debater or orator at the center of the city, talking the talk in town and the local plaza, convincing people of your arguments. No, you get to know the person of Jesus Christ, and he is your wisdom. So... With that said, Paul goes on. He says, this mystery, it was hidden, now it's manifested. And he says, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right, now you see here he's talking about riches, and we're going to talk about riches in a minute but not not your wallet. We're not talking about financial riches. Many might twist this passage, but Paul is focused on another kind of riches, and he says that this, these riches, this glory of this mystery has now been revealed. It's been exposed. It's no longer a secret. In the Old Testament, you might say it was hidden, right? I mean, the Jews didn't see it. It was plastered throughout their scriptures, but the Jews, they didn't see it. Nevertheless, through Jesus and through Paul, bam, it hits the scene, and it is plain and obvious. Jesus is Messiah. This gospel is beyond words. It is powerful and inspiring, and it starts with a deposit of the life of Jesus Christ inside of you and me. So this is not a long distance phone call to heaven every time you wanna pray. You're in the spirit and the spirit's in you. This is not you cranking out morality and ethics, trying to live a good life for Alfie upstairs. Nope, the Alpha and the Omega are living in you. Jesus Christ in your human body because you're now the temple of his spirit. This is some miraculous stuff that you get to walk around planet Earth just beneath your skin and bones and everything that you've called you, just beneath that beautiful personality that God embraces, you have Jesus. Jesus together with you. Vine and branches, both working together. No conflict, no obstacle, but you in union with Jesus, all of him and all of you together. That is this mystery now revealed. Wow. All right, so he says in verse 28, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Paul's an evangelist. He wants people to hear it and believe it. He wants people, if they've heard a taste tester, if they've heard a sample, please continue in it so that you're born again. And when you're born again, you are complete. So no more shopping, 
No more begging and pleading and hoping and waiting for more of God. Fall fresh on me. Come down into this place. Visit me. I need you. Come be with me. The whole message is you're complete. You don't need another portion. You don't need a double blessing. You don't need another baptism. You were placed in completeness into Christ. You are complete. You're lacking nothing. You have everything you need for life and godliness. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Don't seek a second blessing if the first one was complete. Don't seek a second spiritual baptism if the first one worked to the max. So this is what he's saying. In fact, later in chapter 2, he's going to say, don't be duped and do not be suckers for the sales pitch of self-improvement. I don't care if it's the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Gnostics, the rule keepers, the law-abiding citizens. I don't care if it's the moral and the ethical, whoever it is that comes to you and says, you've got Jesus and that's great, but now you need X. And if you would just adopt what I've adopted, you would have super Christianity on your hands. You would be a Christian plus. You would level up. Well, there is no second level when you've already been raised and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Paul's heart is to preach the gospel and present anybody and everybody as being complete in Jesus Christ. He says, for this purpose also I labor, I strive, he says. I'm striving according to his power which mightily works within me. Now, Paul, I mean, that doesn't sound like you're resting. I mean, Paul, you said you were striving. Don't you know the new covenant, Paul? Aren't you relaxing, Paul? Aren't you resting in the finished work, Paul? What's wrong with you? You're striving. No, no, we're supposed to rest. Now, we might misunderstand Paul, but I want you to know that the Christian life is exciting, and Paul knows that. The Christian life is not a life of passivity where we sit back in a spiritual lazy boy chair and just kind of hope that the laundry gets done. Just kind of hope that the home repairs miraculously happen. Just kind of hope that maybe people will hear about the gospel somehow. I don't know how, but I sure hope it kind of happens. Passivity can set in when we don't understand our roles. Look at this. The Apostle Paul is not afraid. He's not afraid to be involved, to be in the thick of it. He's not afraid to make an effort, a holy effort spirit-driven effort to get the gospel out there. Striving, what a word, but striving according to the power that is at work inside of him. So Christ is working and you're working, and Christ is working and you're working. Not as a 50-50, no, no, as a hundred and a hundred. Do you see that? You get to be yourself and Christ lives in you. You get to be who you are as God made you, and you use your brain and your mind and your body and your soul and your spirit. They're all involved, you being fully you, and yet Christ is working mightily in you. Oh, well, no, no, I want to make sure God leads. Don't worry, you're being led by the Spirit. It says you're led. All those who are led by the Spirit are not under the law. That means you are being led. So go ahead in confidence, living from that new heart, knowing that you're led by the Spirit. You're not going to hurt God's feeling. Well, you know, I I mean, I don't want to be legalistic. Well, you're not being legalistic. You know the message. You've got faith in Jesus. You know he lives in you. Go ahead and live. And so what we're seeing here is an incredible opportunity to just live. And the gospel is set up so that we can live, not introspect, not have an infestation of examination, but to live. 
you could examine your navel for the rest of your days. Is this flesh? Is this spirit? Do I have all the right motives? Is this legalistic? Is this the right everything? Or you could do what Paul is saying. I strive. I labor according to this power that I know lives in me. And guess what, man? You're dribbling down the court. You're taking shots and making passes. If you foul this up in some way, don't worry. The ref knows how to blow the whistle. So play the game. God is big. He's not intimidated by you and your personality and your boldness and your sense of humor and your abilities. Go for it. Be aggressive in the Lord. Strive according to his power that is working in you. Always. He'll never stop working. He'll never stop leading. Are we walking in step with him? So simple. Learn who you are in Christ and be yourself. What freedom. All right. I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who've not personally seen my face. Verse 2, he says, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and here it comes, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full uh, assurance, the full assurance of understanding. All right, he's talking about a wealth I mean, he's talking about riches, but it's not what we thought, is it? It's not about increasing the cash in your wallet. It's about a wealth that comes from what? Well, you know. You know what it says, but I'm betting you've also experienced it. The wealth of knowing, of having a full understanding of the gospel. And the full understanding of the gospel leads to what? It says assurance, being sure. Oh my goodness, how many people are not sure? We talk to them every day on the radio program, through our podcast. We get emails. People are not sure. Did I mess it up? Did I go too far? Did I sin one too many times? Is God mad at me? Is he frustrated with me? Has God given up on me? Is he done with me? Is it over? Did I lose my salvation? Did I fall out of God's will? Assurance. The real thing gives you assurance. And Paul calls it a wealth. He calls it riches. It's the best thing on the planet to know that you're okay. And so he says there is a wealth that comes from the full assurance of your understanding. And that's what we're all about, right? At the Grace Message, at the Grace Church, every day, day in, day out, we're helping people see this gospel was better than you thought. And you can be sure. You can have full assurance that you're forgiven in Christ and you're free in Christ and you're new in Christ and you're clean and close in Christ. And what that does is it gives people confidence to live the life, not shrinking back in fear over there in the corner, wondering if they'll squeak by with God, but knowing that they are the righteousness of Jesus Christ that they are as righteous as he is because he made them that way. You start believing you're righteous and holy and blameless and clean and close, and oh my goodness, you will not know what to do with all that assurance. Paul continues, he says, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you hear this? I mean, people might think we're wise. Someone called into the radio program the other day. They said, oh, Andrew, you're so wise. I said, look, I'm just some guy. I'm some guy that knows Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus, he's the mystery. And in him is all knowledge Don't worship knowledge. Don't worship wisdom. Worship Christ. If you're just looking to some attribute, you're going to miss the person. And this, again, 
this gospel, when you've got it, you can have it like fishermen had it. You can have it like those tax collectors had it when they were saved. You can have it like little children have it. It's not about being some sort of brainiac, some sort of theologian, some sort of expert in information. It is so simple. Did the cross work or did the cross work? Did the resurrection result in success or not? And as we make these decisions, we become wise in the Lord. We become wise in the gospel. You are wise as you have decided it is finished. The best kind of wisdom that we can possess is not a bunch of information in our brains, but the wisdom to decide that Jesus is enough and his grace is sufficient and that Jesus will never die again because he doesn't need to and that you are clean and close and forgiven and blameless and holy and righteous because of Jesus. When you believe that, you're wise and there is no better wisdom. All right, to finish out this passage today, he says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. All right, is that happening today? You better believe it's happening today. Oh my goodness. I mean, you're going to hear it's, it's great that you got that grace, but it's time to graduate from that grace. I mean, you started with grace, but now we got to worry about obedience, and that's different. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's the obedience of faith, and your faith is in God's grace. And by God's grace, he gave you an obedient heart, right? So we start hearing things as people try to delude us. I'm sure 2,000 years ago in Colossae, it was different. I mean, their, their deceptions and the temptation to be distracted, it had everything to do with you need some real smarts here, and the Epicureans can help you. You need some smarts, and the the Stoics, they've got it going on. You need some secret knowledge, and the Gnostics can come to your aid. Those were the temptations to blend religions, to mix belief systems, to take a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Stoicism, A little bit of Jesus and a little bit of philosophy. A little bit of Christ and a little bit of that Greek knowledge that'll help you get by. Well, today, it's a little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of holy effort. A little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of self-improvement. A little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of church programs. A little bit of Jesus and some heavy fasting. A little bit of Jesus and maybe keeping the Sabbath too, you know, just in case. A little bit of Jesus and then make sure that he's helping you, helping you keep the law as if that were his goal. Friends, his goal is to cause you to bear fruit. He's not interested in you doing Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus plus nothing, 100% natural, no additives. All right, as we bring this to a close for today, he says, for even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith. I'm not with you. I'm not there. I'm not present. But I have heard that you are not getting distracted. You think this discipline is about them you know, uh, doing a lot of Bible study? You think it's their quiet time? You think it's their street witnessing? You think it takes discipline for them to get jazzed about the God? No, that's not the discipline. The discipline in context, because we care about context, right? The discipline is the discipline not to be distracted. What did the previous verse say? Well, it talked about the distractions, right? These delusions, these delusions that you could be distracted by, so it takes discipline to fix your eyes on Jesus and not allow yourself to be distracted by those empty philosophies. So he's praising him, and he's saying you've got stability. Earlier, he called it assurance. 
Now he's calling it stability. And that's what we have, don't we? The grace of God makes us stable. All right, last verse of the day. He says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. It doesn't change. The method doesn't stop. Just as you received him, so walk in him. How did you get started? You said, I cannot save myself, Lord. Only you can save me, and I'm going to let you. You had an attitude of frailty and weakness and dependency and humility. Now, how do we continue? The same way. I'm frail. I'm human. I'm weak. But in my weakness, I discover your strength, Lord. I can't live the Christian life. Only you can, and I'm going to let you. Do you see that just as we received him, we walk in him? There's no game change. There's no level up. There's no second method. There's no other way. It is Jesus from start to finish because he is enough. Will you trust him? What if Jesus living in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, what if the download of the life of Christ in you is the only reason you behave. Oh my goodness, if that's true, then you are walking in him just as you received him. It's all about him. Let's give thanks. Father, we are so grateful for the truth of the gospel, that it is not our best effort, our heroic way of gaining favor and self-improving. We don't need it because you have already told us that we're presented to you blameless, holy, beyond reproach. You're not criticizing us. You're not dragging us into a courtroom. You have no clipboard or scorecard to speak of. You remember our sins no more. And you've qualified us and put us in union, Christ in us. We don't need a movement. We need Jesus. We don't need a campaign. We need Jesus. We don't need self-improvement principles. We need Jesus. It's not about principles. It's about a person. You, Father. Your life in us. We're so grateful. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.